The Kamala Harris candidacy is energizing Democrats across the country by just about any metric. New donations, volunteers, memes, they've all exploded on the scene. Here's another metric. Enthusiasm for Harris is also breaking Zoom. Hours after President Biden bowed out of the race and endorsed his VP on Sunday, more than 40,000 people joined a Zoom call for black women supporters, and they raised more than one and a half million dollars. Another Zoom call for black men drew more than 50,000 supporters the next day. Separate calls followed for young voters, LGBTQ allies, South Asians, and more. And on Thursday, more than 160 thousand Harris supporters joined one single Zoom call. That's the most ever. In fact, the company said its engineers had to get involved to avoid a crash. That call was rallying white women for Harris. Now, this is important because a majority of white women have voted for the Republican in every presidential race since 2000. But they have more at stake in this election than ever before, organizers say. Participants in the call included the actress Connie Britton. Pop star Pink, who reportedly joined right after a performance, and the soccer star Megan Rapino, who said that it was past time for white women to step up. This is our opportunity to show up not only for ourselves, but for black women. They've given us the whole playbook um, on how to show up and energize and be organized and um, really do the right thing and to tap into all of our networks. Um, so let's just follow their lead. Organizers say they raised $2 million while the call was going on, glitches and all, and they've raised more than $8.5 million in total. It's a staggering amount of money for what we're talking about, getting a bunch of people on a Zoom call, and a staggering amount of energy in a race that had very little over a week ago. Leah Greenberg is the founder and co-executive director of the progressive organizing nonprofit Indivisible. She was on that historic call yesterday, and she joins me now. Leah, good to see you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I, you know, they're, they're, uh, I've been listening to some conservative commentators who've been saying that this enthusiasm is manufactured. I, I, would, I would invite them to join us on a yeah. call like the one we had last night or at a call like the one for Women for Harris, uh, organizing call that's coming up on Monday where we are going to break Zoom records once again. Uh, I can tell you, I'm part of a grassroots network. I've got leaders all over the country. I have not seen excitement like this in years. I, they are coming out of the woodwork. They are thrilled. They are organizing with the kind of energy that reminds you of the early Obama years. People are feeling such joy, such power such excitement uh, that the Harris campaign has unleashed. And, and last night was just one example. Of that. One of the interesting things, the uh, decisions that the Harris campaign seems to have taken is to to speak about the future, to present this optimistic view, view of the future in contrast to this dystopian, dark vision that Donald Trump seems to offer uh, everyone. And it's working for, for Kamala Harris. She is someone who smiles a lot. She is someone who laughs a lot. Uh, conservatives are trying to uh, punish her for that. But in fact, she sees a future and she puts out ads and she talks to women and says, the future can be ours. It can be quite bright. Talk to me about that. I think that's absolutely right. I think what a lot of people are feeling right now is that she's unleashed a sense of joy and finding power in joy uh, in this election that a lot of folks, uh, even if they were really determined to beat Donald Trump, did not feel right up until this moment. And I think her bringing together not just that future, but also freedom, right? She is mm -hmm. standing for freedom. She's bringing in these themes around her vision is about freedom. Their vision is about Project 2025 and control. Which of these two futures do you want to live in? And that is just an incredibly powerful contrast. And it could be a contrast that would overwhelm people with fear if it wasn't coming from such a joyful messenger. So as far as women go, white, white women in particular, <clears throat> there's some people who are sort of sad about the fact that they didn't have the opportunity or take the opportunity when they had a chance to elect a woman president uh, in 2016. So there's that. And there's the fact that now this woman who is running for president is the the antidote to something that many people are scared about. Is this could this be the election in which white women do something that they haven't done in 24 years, that they they are going to actually vote for a woman and a Democratic candidate? Look, Indivisible, our network, it came out of 2016, right, when a lot of women were deeply disappointed to see not only that uh, Hillary Clinton had lost, but that the new president was going to be Donald Trump. And those women, they took their anger, they took their energy, they turned it towards organizing. They realized they needed to organize, and that included quite a lot of white women who had been really surprised by that outcome. Uh, and they, over the last eight years, they've been organizing, they've been building that power. And what I am hearing from them is that they see in Kamala Harris 
they see the chance to not just resist MAGA, to not just resist Trump, but to fundamentally change America and to finally achieve that woman president. And we're going to do that by talking to as many voters as we possibly can. Um, first, I want to just 100 percent agree with Maya uh, on her what her analysis just was. I think James Carville is totally wrong. I mean, I think the Harris campaign expects the Republicans to come at them. But the enthusiasm is actually what America wants right now. There's this hunger, this incredible hunger through the struggle of the last four years and the darkness of the last four years and the sort of pain of the last four years and the cruelty of what the, the Trump and the GOP have done, that there's this idea of like, let's get out there and celebrate and challenge and move and have fun and finally get past this holding the hill and let's take it to the battlefield. So I think that enthusiasm is key to her victory in the course of this. And I would advise James Carville and all white <laughs> political operative, uh, old white political operatives to trust the Harris campaign, the savvy and the smartness of the campaign. And if I, James, if I was advising James Carville to spend time, I would tell him to spend time to convince other old white guys to vote for, for to vote for Kamala Harris in the course of this. Now on your poll numbers, I actually think that we have not yet fully captured what's happened in this race. I think my belief is we're going to quickly soon see soon Vice President Harris ahead in the national polls in this. There's been two polls out of New Hampshire and Maine that show her now up seven or eight points. Those races were tied a month ago in those states. And in that New York Times poll, what, what we see happens in polling and when there's movement in a race and sudden change, what happens first is enthusiasm first is change. We've seen that in all of the metrics you mentioned. Then what changes is favorability numbers of a candidate when they emerge in the course of this. And in that New York Times poll, Kamala Harris has moved from a negative 19 net favorability, negative 19 to negative three. So a 16 point shift to the positive in two weeks. That's an amazing thing. And as that happens, as enthusiasm moves to favorability moves, then the ballot numbers move. And so I think one thing your viewers should keep in mind is the high point, the person that exhibited the honeymoon in this race was Donald Trump and what happened with the convention, the VP pick, and then the attempted assassination. That's his high point. So if I were the Trump folks, I'd be really concerned at his high point in this race, he's one point ahead. That's a that's the high point in this race in the midst of a honeymoon that Donald Trump had. And so I think there's lots of battles to be fought. This is going to be an electoral college race. But I, for one, see the shift in this race as tremendously fundamental. And over the course of the next few days and weeks, we're going to really capture how how much it has fundamentally changed. And Eugene, we are where we are, of course, because of a debate. So let's talk a possible future debate. As you know, Donald Trump had said yes, and then he said he didn't really trust or um, he wasn't thrilled, at least, with ABC. That was after he had agreed to the September date. Now he wants to wait until uh, Kamala Harris is officially the nominee. What are you hearing? What's the buzz? Is there going to be a debate? You know, no one knows because so much of the way that the Trump campaign, even Republicans operate is kind of at the whim of, of, of Donald Trump, right? If he wakes up one day and he wants to debate, he'll say it and that will be the message. If he wakes up um, and doesn't, then that will that will also be the message. I will say, you know, the, the Harris campaign, it's weird to say the Harris campaign. I will say it's been a few days, the, <laughs> what used to be the Biden campaign, but the Harris campaign, you know, what she said, when she said, I'm ready, let's go. That is the feeling they have. They want to put these two people on stage and have the American people have a complete and have them have it out and understand the big differences because it's very hard to find two humans that think about and represent different things um, of this country than Vice President Kamala Harris and, and Donald Trump, right? And just a few weeks, just a week and a half ago, we were talking about having, you know, two older white men on stage running in this race, a, a race that was a redo of 2020. And the fundamentals, it seems, have changed, right? Like it opens up an entirely different electorate for Vice President Harris, her team feels. Maybe there are different states that she, so she doesn't just have to focus on, um, you know, the, the, the blue wall, the Michigan, um, Wisconsin, and, and Pennsylvania. So they are, they feel really good about that, and they feel like they're in a position of strength, especially as you have um, former President Trump kind of, it seems, waffling on whether or not he's going to do a debate. Trump has unlocked an absolute tsunami against him. 
This, it, we've never seen anything like this. I know Trump has spent his entire life pissing women off, pissing all decent people off. We know this. But this has never happened. Harris is, you know, like there's that thing, oh, they're going to break the internet because it's so, things went so viral. Harris is literally breaking massive portions of the internet. The internet cannot handle how excited people are. Like, I, it's not competition, but like, Biden never did this. Hillary never did this. Obama, we got to be honest. Obama, it was a different time. Internet was, uh, you know, people had the internet, but it wasn't, it wasn't what it was now, right? The internet wasn't as big, but even Obama didn't quite do this. I, I don't think anyway, maybe people will, will have comments about that, but Hillary and Joe never did this. They never energized people like this. They just didn't. They got millions of people to vote for them. They got tons of people. But they didn't do this. And it's a mixture of the, 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 the anger Donald Trump is inspiring, the fear he's inspiring, the horrifying videos and messages he and his team are putting out, but also the genuine enthusiasm for Harris. This is the first time on, on the presidential ticket for a lot of people, especially young people, but not just them, since maybe 2008, that they've been this excited to vote for somebody in a general election. The last time young people were excited like this was for Bernie, but in a general election, it hasn't been since Barack Obama, not even the second time, because a lot of people were jaded by the second election. It, this goes back to 2007, 2008. And Harris is seizing this moment. And Donald Trump realizes that if he couldn't beat unenthusiastic Democratic bases uniting around Biden and Clinton and Clinton, he won, you know, but the popular vote, there's no, there's no way he's going to beat Kamala Harris. There's no way.